Good afternoon, everyone. We got we got there, so we got the slide up there. Not the slide. There's very much. To the slides. Good afternoon. My name is Colin Harvey, and I'll be uh, co-presenting this presentation with my colleague Professor Rory O'Connell from Ulster University. And my part of this is just to outline the project that we're currently uh, undertaking and is uh, Brexit related. We're uh, Brexit Law NI, and we're a collaboration between Queen's University Belfast, Ulster University, and the human rights NGO CAJ. We're a ESRC funded 18 month project. We started in April, and somebody in the audience can do the maths and work out when we end. So we're part of the UK and a changing Europe initiative. And I think I would highlight the work of that broader initiative because there are a number and a wide range of other research projects that are going on around that initiative that are well worth looking into. And, and we're only one part of that. In terms of Brexit Law NI, we, are, um, we have a website, which is brexitlawni.org. Uh, we're on Twitter, apparently, and Facebook. I'm not, but we are as a project. So please do have a look at our website. Uh, follow us on Twitter and do whatever you do in relation to Facebook, I think is probably the, the best way to describe it. Uh, we're looking specifically at Brexit in Northern Ireland, the human rights, equality, conflict transformation, and constitutional consequences of uh, all of that. And I think we understand the Brexit context quite well. We are specifically honing in on those four elements of the consequences of Brexit for here. If you look at our website, you'll see that on Friday in an event at Queen's called Brexit in Northern Ireland, the story so far, we launched our preliminary findings across each of the six areas of our project. So please have a look at those preliminary findings. They're deliberately written to be quite short, concise, and accessible to all. Have a look at them, see if you agree with them or disagree with them, and please do let us know. What are we looking at, you're asking yourselves? Well, we're working across six key themes. We're looking at Brexit and the peace process here, Brexit and North-South relations, Brexit and the border, border controls and free movement, Brexit and xenophobia and racism in Northern Ireland, issues of socioeconomic rights, in particular questions around the e employment and other socioeconomic rights protections, and the wider human rights and equality landscape and questions raised by Brexit. So we've published our preliminary findings across those six areas, which I would encourage you to have a look at, and Rory's gonna say a bit more about some of those in a moment. Uh, so far, we've conducted a range of interviews, a number of stakeholder meetings, and we're holding a number of town hall meetings uh, during the autumn, uh, one of which is part of the ESRC Festival of Social Science in Belfast, uh, including another one in Derry in December as well. So we're looking to hear further from people then. We'll be producing uh, a range of research reports across these six areas at the end of this project and hoping to disseminate, disseminate those widely and inform the wider public discussion. We're very, very conscious and mindful that uh, there are many other projects going on on Brexit at the moment. In fact, if there's anybody in the room not working on something Brexit related, I'd be amazed. So we're, we're conscious of overlap. We're conscious of trying to be complementary where possible. And this is a discrete project, but we will very much reach our own evidence-based Brexit law NH Brexit Law NI conclusions at the end of our project about those consequences. So please follow us and keep an eye out for our work as it progresses. Before I hand you over to Rory, just a few final points. Um, obviously, the vote we know about and what's happened since we know about. It seems very clear that, irrefutable really, that Brexit has a profoundly destabilizing impact in Northern Ireland among other things, reopening the sovereignty fracture here that the European Union and the Good Friday Agreement 1998 did so much to try and heal. It has had and it will have serious implications in relation to rights and equality protections here. And I think we've already been fairly clear in our preliminary findings on that point. 
Brexit has also, as we all know in this room, reopened intensive constitutional and other debates on the border. And I think one of the fascinating aspects of Brexit, and perhaps one of the unforeseen consequences of Brexit by the British government, was the extent to which Brexit has escalated our issues, has escalated the issues of the border, has escalated the issues of the island of Ireland to the EU level. So while the Westminster Parliament, you know, as a constitutional law teacher, I can't fail to mention this, is uh, a key part of the UK constitution, it's not the only game in town. And a lot of the significant and important debates around be Brexit and the consequences for this island are actually, in fact, happening uh, elsewhere. In terms of thinking this through so far, and it really it echoes a point that was, was made earlier. Um, if the debate here is to be a sensible one, uh, a credible one, and is to go forward in a constructive way, I think there has to be recognition that this place is already supposed to enjoy a special constitutional status. The idea that Northern Ireland is just one further example of devolution within the UK seems to me to be profoundly unhelpful. And I think without that initial recognition that there is already supposed to be something special going on here constitutionally, I don't think we can have a really constructive and helpful uh, conversation. And that, that's emerged fairly clearly from the work so, so far that we've been doing. In terms of the human rights and equality concerns that we're looking at, they in a sense have to find their place within that broader conversation and within the consequences of Brexit and that's what we'll specifically be looking at and that is complex. One thing we've noticed and I think Rory will also be talking about and then when I put on my other hat in the Bill of Rights conversation, one of the things that is often said about this place and here and people are often asked is about solutions across a range of areas. One of the things that is really very evident from the work we've done so far and from the work we've done in other projects is that this place is coming down in solutions across a whole host of issues. I think there have been very, very thought through solutions proposed, particularly the area of rights and equality. The issue has often been getting those solutions implemented in practical terms, or to be totally candid, sometimes getting those solutions actually read by participants in some of the public conversations. And I think it's a useful time to revisit and remind ourselves about some of the past solutions that are already out there in the areas of human rights and equality and make sure that they're informing the public conversation. And if we can help in our research project, we'll be we'll be trying to help in doing that as part of the bigger conversation that's going on now. So I shall stop at this point and hand you over to my colleague, Professor Rory O'Connell, mm -hmm. who's going to be talking about some of the human rights and equality consequences. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Colin. So as Colin was saying, I want to talk to you a bit more in detail about the equality, socioeconomic and human rights implications of Brexit and possible ways forward. Uh, so thinking first of all about socioeconomic issues and related equality issues, uh, for us it seems to be important to remember that uh, issues about equality and socioeconomic rights are central to the history of the conflict in Northern Ireland. Uh, issues about discrimination in relation to housing and employment uh, being among the important causes of the conflict. And, of course, the conflict itself has had uh, knock-on implications for the social and economic well-being of this territory. In that light, the 1998 Belfast or Good Friday Agreement uh, devotes considerable attention to equality matters and associate economic issues, as are referred to in the agreement. It talks about matters like a single equality commission and uh, introducing a then highly novel equality mainstreaming statutory duty. Uh, and of course, alongside the uh, agreement itself, there were reforms to the fair employment laws in 1998 with the Fair Employment and Treatment Order uh, and equality measures in relation to recruitment for the police service. Uh, so equality and socioeconomic issues very much central to the agreement. Um, 
since then, quality developments have been somewhat stalled in Northern Ireland. There, haven't, there hasn't been as much progress on some issues as might have been anticipated. Uh, certainly when I moved to Northern Ireland in 2001, people were telling me very excitedly about plans for a single equality bill, um, which is one of those uh, solutions that we may have to come back to, as Colin indicated. Uh, Brexit raises then a number of challenges in this area uh, because the European Union has often acted as a guarantor of minimum rights in this area and has acted as a driver for equality law reform in the past 15 years. Um, we've seen major developments, especially in relation to uh, sexual orientation discrimination and other areas, thanks to uh, European Union law and the Court of Justice of the European Union. Uh, so there is a risk that some of these uh, protections and some of these drivers for change will be lost uh, with Brexit. The UK position paper in Ireland and Northern Ireland does refer to protecting the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement in all of its parts and does refer to notions of equality and parity of esteem, uh, though in context it seems to be referring more narrowly to how to deal with the ethno-national divide in Northern Ireland rather than broader issues of equality protection. Uh, so there are uh, threats to equality and socioeconomic rights in Brexit and we need to think about possible solutions to that. Uh, and in this regard, it's important to note the European Union withdrawal bill currently stalled in Parliament. Uh, doesn't actually have any explicit protection for these sorts of rights and equality measures, uh, even though it's, the government has stated that it's not the intention to diminish these standards. The government has also pointed to the idea of a co the common travel area uh, as one way of protecting the interests of, in particular, British and Irish citizens going forward. Uh, but the common travel area is a relatively underdeveloped and understudied concept, so we still have a lot of work to do to understand precisely how that will work in order to remedy what will be lost with the UK's exit from the European Union. Uh, and this is part, of course, of a broader discussion about how human rights and equality are more generally protected in Northern Ireland. The agreement devoted a lot of attention not just to equality and socioeconomic issues, but more broadly uh, to issues in a section on rights, safeguards, and equality of opportunity. Uh, when it talked about things like the creation of a national human rights institution and the possibility of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland that would build on the European Convention, uh, cooperation between the Northern Irish Human Rights Commission and the Irish Human Rights Commission, and in particular discussions on a possible All-Ireland Charter. There was a reference to the notion of um, equivalence uh, in the agreement, uh, stated as an obligation on the Irish government to ensure uh, a measure of protection for rights at least equivalent to that pertaining in Northern Ireland. Of course, at that time, uh, Ireland was behind Northern Ireland in terms of progress on creating a national human rights institution and behind also in terms of the incorporation of the European Convention on Human Rights into national law. Uh, and the European Union has played a major role in, more generally in terms of protecting human rights as well as specifically equality and socioeconomic rights. Uh, this is through a variety of European Union measures that you find in treaties, that you find in European Union secondary legislation such as regulations and directives, uh, and also in a, a document that has gotten rather more attention recently than hitherto, the European Union's charter of fundamental rights, not to be confused with the European Convention on Human Rights. Uh, and the protections offered by the European Union in respect of these rights are important in a number of ways. Uh, they are, of course, limited because they only apply whenever European Union law is applicable, that's to say within the scope of European Union law. Uh, but when they do apply, uh, they apply in a much stronger manner than other human rights protections in the UK. So UK courts, even in, at the lowest of courts, an industrial tribunal, can refuse to apply an act of the UK Parliament if it breaches EU rights. Uh, there is a possibility under what is known as the Frankovich Doctrine for individuals to obtain compensation for harms caused to their EU rights, even if those harms are caused by an act of Parliament. 
and there is the important role of the Court of Justice of the European Union in interpreting and developing these EU rights. So it's, for instance, thanks to uh, a judgment of the, European, of the Court of Justice of the European Union that EU sex discrimination law covers discrimination on the grounds of gender reassignment surgery. Uh, so the EU has been quite heavily bound up with the protection of human rights in uh, these islands and across the European Union. We identify some uh, possible solutions or ways forward uh, that we think need to be factored into the debate as we look at how the UK goes about exiting the European Union. Uh, some of these are fairly obvious in that we need to look at the detail of the withdrawal bill. Um, currently, as we know, uh, stalled. We don't know for how long in Parliament. Um, the withdrawal bill includes quite important discretionary powers for ministers to make uh, changes to the law, either in order to correct uh, the law pending uh, exit day, or to implement uh, the withdrawal agreement between the UK and the European Union. Uh, and the discretionary powers there are especially wide, uh, it, it, it explicitly being said that the powers can be used to amend the Withdrawal Act itself. So the UK government has said it's not intended to use these powers in order to diminish uh, important standards in relation to equality and other issues, uh, but we suggest this needs to be written into the uh, act, into the bill, in order to make sure it is a guarantee. Uh, we also think it's time to consider recommendations in particular from the Equality Commission, but not just the Equality Commission, on how to strengthen uh, Northern Ireland's equality legislation through finally adopting uh, a Northern Ireland's single equality bill. We're well behind Great Britain now in this regard and indeed the Republic of Ireland. Uh, and uh, we think it's important that whatever solutions are adopted going forward, and there will have to be many, uh, because the complexity of what is, and the scale of what is being envisaged is frankly mind-boggling, uh, that it's important that there be rigorous equality and human rights proofing of proposed solutions, and we think the existing Section 75 of the Northern Ireland Act is an important mechanism that will need to be faithfully implemented. More broadly, uh, looking at issues of uh, human rights, uh, the EU withdrawal bill uh, sometimes referred to um, as a, a download and save bill. So all EU law will be downloaded and saved into EU law until it is, uh, if it ever it is, changed by UK authorities. Uh, it is in fact a great retention bill. Uh, the main purpose of it is to ensure there is not a legal vacuum on the day after exit day. Uh, so most EU law is saved as retained EU law in the withdrawal bill. Uh, there is one exception uh, for reasons that are a bit unclear, uh, which is the Charter of Fundamental Rights. Uh, so there is uh, resistance to including this in retained EU law. Uh, and we think uh, it would be important to look at ensuring protections for the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, and uh, general principles of law in EU law, just as it's proposed to retain other measures of EU law. Beyond that, though, uh, and this is what Colin was suggesting earlier, we think the challenges raised by Brexit uh, in terms of potentially lifting restrictions or changing the way restrictions on especially the Northern Irish authorities uh, will function, uh, the risk to the concept of equivalence as Northern Ireland will no longer be part of the European Union, uh, there is a risk of diverging uh, standards in relation to equality and other matters on this island. Uh, that it's uh, timely to revisit some of the solutions originally put forward in the Good Friday or Belfast Agreement, uh, such as the Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, uh, and even perhaps revisit that idea of an All-Ireland Charter of Rights, uh, which the two human rights commissions were supposed to be working on. Uh, so those are some of our uh, preliminary thoughts and preliminary suggestions. As Colin said, we're very much in uh, dialogue mode, so uh, we're very happy to hear ideas, uh, problems, possible solutions. Uh, and we will have many opportunities for further uh, discussion 
in, in a few weeks. Uh, like Leslie, we're also part of the ESRC Festival of Social Sciences, so uh, do email me if you want to, uh, details of events. There's more than 30 events involving the universities taking place across Northern Ireland in early November. Uh, it, and on December, so on November 7th, we will have a Brexit Town Hall in the Black Box uh, uh, in the evening uh, with the Brexit Law and I team. And on December 7th, we will have a lunchtime town hall in McGee, in Derry, in Londonderry, uh, to continue the discussion, the dialogue on Brexit uh, and Northern Ireland. So thank you very much. Thank you.